I will. Uh, we already introduced ourselves, but uh, for those who just arrived, uh, I'm Michael. I'm a designer at Good Request Digital Studio, and uh, I'm leading a team here. So I'm more up on the strategic level than uh, into the technical part of the design. And as well as Joe, he's, um, he's my friend. And uh, we are online from Slovakia or me, and Joe is from Czech Republic joining us. So if you can introduce yourself, Joe, that would be great. Yeah, sure. Uh, well, thanks for having me. Uh, looking forward to this fun chat uh, and uh, fun topic. Um, so I, my background is in visual design and started in graphic design and uh, then uh, slowly but surely with my interest in technology moved into um, user experience, user interface probably would be the place where I started, um, started sort of growing this interest of, of how design works, not just sort of the, 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 the visuality and the aesthetics of it. Um, then I moved to Finland, uh, worked at Musician uh, as a UX lead for two years, which is uh, mad amounts of fun. Um, I also studied interactive media there. And nowadays, um, I uh, focus a lot on entrepreneurship and questions of why we should design in the first place, right? Um, so currently, I start my studies at Royal College of Arts and Imperial College uh, in the field of global innovation design. Um, yeah, looking forward to asking some of these more in-depth and more profound questions about why are we making stuff in the first place. Mm. Um, yeah. What a wonderful intro. Thank you, Joe. <laughs> okay, and uh, so uh, why, we, why we choose this? Uh, can this meeting be recorded? Of course it is, no problem. We can post it then uh, in the event. Cool, <laughs> great, <laughs> okay. So uh, why, we, why we choose this topic? I mean, why we choose to talk about the kickoff uh, phase of uh, designing process? I mean, that's the very beginning of the process. And uh, we all know from the experience that, you know, when the, when the client comes to you and he has a pretty good vision about what he wants to build, he has some kind of specification what he wants you to, to design. And so you jump into the process directly, start um, creating wireframes. And uh, another attendee, welcome. And, uh, and then after, after some weeks and hours spent on uh, designing, you will realize that uh, you are designing something for uh, the wrong problem and you end up with, uh, with a solution, maybe, mm. maybe even a great solution, but for the wrong problem. And, uh, yeah, so that's why we choose to uh, talk about this and why this is important, especially for the success of the project and what's the influence of uh, the kickoff phase to the success of the project. Yeah, so what do we have uh, in the agenda? So uh, solving the right problem versus delivering the best solution, that's the already topic I have tackled. But what's the difference between the problem and uh, versus inquiry. I mean, if you if you know, you can join the conversation as well. But uh, yeah, when the client comes to you and uh, he has some good specification, that's the inquiry, right? He has some uh, some kind of uh, bullets, uh, some features, sometimes even very detailed. But that's not the problem. That's just kind of a already he already imagined a, a good solution for his problem so what is our goal joe to what should we do now as mm -hmm. designers yep um so yeah you raised a couple of interesting points there and uh one thing i kind of gracefully omitted from from my introduction is that in the past uh two three years i've focused a lot on, on facilitating creative process and facilitating collaboration um, and what you're talking about there, uh, with, you know, the, the, the customer coming to you or to all of us really with this very detailed and specific requirements or ideas of what they want to build this sort of, a um, sense that, um, you know, maybe they saw something cool somewhere, um, or, or 
or perhaps they uh, they have an idea that they got in the shower and they thought that this would make for a great startup. Um, the, the part of the challenge there is that sort of they they're pretty far along the along the journey of making stuff at that point, right? And then there is this it's almost the tip of the iceberg, um, where kind of the the, the really interesting questions lies uh, before before that uh, point when you actually start having a vision for for a concrete solution that you can start prototyping and exploring. So. Um, I think we all are familiar with design thinking uh, methodologies and user centered design and uh, at least superficially um, we've heard about these topics and uh, the interesting thing about them is that they quite delay um, that point of actually getting into you know prototyping or getting to concrete making of an artifact right they're very focused on the, the problem space the problem definition. Um, and there's this whole uh, aspect of um, user research, um, uh, requirements gathering, that those types of initial con conversations um, that really broaden our knowledge uh, before jumping into specific solutions. Um, so the, the point that I think you're, you're raising there, Michal, is like, how do you realign the conversation with the customer at that point um, more towards that sort of collaborative research oriented design process um, that works ultimately for the greater good of the project uh, rather than trying to just serve that particular idea that they came up with or came to you with. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah but sometimes, you know, as a designer, and especially when you are beginning and you don't have uh, so much experience uh, in this, it might mm -hmm. be hard for you as a designer to uh, get into the conversation uh, with the client that, that why we should talk mm -hmm. about the initial idea and what was before the specification and before all the ballots he came to you, mm -hmm. he, he brought to you. Um, it's, it's, um, it might be a hard position for us as designers to talk with the clients mm -hmm. you know, about what happened when they first get an, an idea and why is this important? Right. Um, yeah. So yeah, I, I, you raise a wonderful point though about uh, it's, it's almost a point of self-reflection um, as a designer rather than, you know, just thinking about your confidence or your ability to speak um, the client's language or be able to sort of push back. I think there is an interesting thought about what really is valuable in design uh, as a process. What is the value that we deliver to the customer, right? And um, one thing that I kind of try to challenge in my thinking, or one thing that I realized is in my journey as a designer is, uh, is that transition from craft to value, right? You, you, do you kind of, get the nuance of, of that I'm talking about? Because lots of design, lots of design education is focused on the how of making, right? Um, the, I don't know, like usability requirements or wireframing or having confident command of your design tool uh, like Figma or uh, Adobe Illustrator or Photoshop or whatever else, right? Um, or understanding your uh, human interface guidelines if you're designing for Apple uh, or material design if you're designing for Android. It's, it's very crafts focused, um, which is an important component, right? But we're all practical makers and um, looking at it from that point of self-reflection, is that really the most valuable thing of the designed artifact? The fact that we can inject it with masterful craft or is there more to it? Of course, there is more. <laughs> there like, is the value why do you, behind. Why do, you, why do you get into design, Michal? Because I love challenges. I love to solve problems. Uh -huh. So that's the, uh, yeah. <laughs> maybe I could extend that question also to Romina. And, yeah, uh, yeah. There's no... Mm -hmm. uh, creativity and um, mm -hmm. chance to uh, think out of the box, be yourself, 
express yourself the way you are. Like you were saying, um, crafting something and also delivering the value from your craft to, uh -huh. to the customer, to the client. And it's, it's really interesting and it's never ending learning process. Um, it's, Lovely. it's interaction with people, uh, solving problems, creating something and yeah. So you both are touching on this really interesting things. Uh, you've, you've had that mention of challenges and that creativity and self-expression, which I think are very uh, nice and personal aspects. And then you both touched on this questions of problem solving, value delivery, and so on, right? Um, so when the client comes, it, they don't really come to us to necessarily just get the craft uh, side of things, right? Because our expertise is also in understanding what makes product useful, what makes product, um, what makes products uh, commercially viable uh, from the point of view of uh, building something that users will use and understand, right? So, um, mm -hmm. and sorry to interrupt mm -hmm. you, Joe, but this is a uh, this is a really good thing. Why they actually come to us, you know? Why? That's the main question because um, it can be because they just want to create a product. Why they came to us just to create a product? Because what? What we communicate to them? Maybe mm. that's the question. You know, you know, you know what I mean? If we communicate that we yeah. are designers and then we are using a crowd and we can design that and we design that and make some beautiful UI, then of course they will come to us and ask for a beautiful UI. Mm. So yeah, maybe maybe that bring us to the question what we are actually selling as designers. Right. Yeah, it's they are seeing the the surface actually, right? They're they're seeing again kind of the, the metaphor of the tip of the iceberg. They're seeing the tip of the iceberg. They're maybe not necessarily seeing all the all all the ice that makes it float and that actually enables its existence. Right. So when you see that finalized app. Uh, you sort of see that beautiful polished interface, you see that smooth code um, that makes it very performant on a device. Um, what they don't necessarily realize is uh, that sort of deep user understanding that had to be built, the information architecture that had to be created in order to enable that thing to work. Um, they don't necessarily see, uh, I might have mentioned already user research, right? They don't necessarily see the connection that the design team and the engineering team and the management team behind that product needed to make between the requirements of the users, the capabilities of the technology and the actual commercial viability of the thing, right? And it's potential, I don't marketing viability and all these aspects. So a lot of this is, um, yeah, a lot of this is not necessarily visible to a customer when they come for the first time. And you're right. Uh, you're right that there's this question of sales. I'd, I'd say um, that for my freelance experience, uh, it's the kickoff starts with the sales process, um, right? And it could, it's, it's almost as simple as, for, for some agencies, it's as simple as just showcasing what are the steps of your process on your website, even though I think that's a little bit less important. Um, it, to when you think about it more humanly, it's perhaps a conversation, right? Because there's a question of realigning the customer's expectations um, about the, the process and the work that you're going to be delivering and the, the necessary aspect. Because, yeah, you posed the question, why do they come to us? To get a polished, beautiful app that's, uh, that has a pretty and aesthetic design? Not really, right? They come to us to have a product that will generate revenue for them ultimately, or deliver some other form of value. If they're a nonprofit, perhaps it's a product that will entice and encourage uh, people to give, um, to support causes. Um, if it's a, a prosthetic um, device or, or some sort of a medical device, um, obviously the value there lies in, in, in uh, in serving that person who's going to be using it very well, right? Um, so their ultimate goal is somewhere around there. And 
the beautiful design, the aesthetics, they're just means. Um, they're one of the tools, one of the means to getting there. Um, so it's kind of an interesting question. How do you help the customer understand that this is indeed the case? This is the value that we bring to the table. Um, yeah. I've, mm -hmm. I've started saying the, the interface is never a problem. <laughs> It's a hyperbole because sometimes that can be a problem. I mean, if you have a, a really bad user interface, that can be an issue, but it tends not to be the key problem why mm -hmm. products don't work when you think about it. They fail because of something else. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. But the, your first question was that uh, um, why? I mean, uh, you ask, you mentioned two points, right? Uh, the second was that, uh, second was this one. And uh, the first was about why they come to us. I mean, the clients and how they know that we are actually delivering something more. And it, and it mm -hmm. goes to the selling point. I mean, uh, what we are selling as designers is uh, equally important as, uh, I mean, mm. it is equal to the success of the project because uh, we can't be surprised when the client arrives uh, at our door and he asks us to build just the, the interface and, and polish it. And um, when we are selling that, you know, I mean, so mm. I made a highlight, uh, kickoff starts with the, with, the, with the sales, but I think we can change that into the, into project starts with uh, with the sales because the 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 project mm -hmm. itself and the success of the project uh, comes with a good kickoff and a good kickoff comes from the sales at the beginning and and so on and so on it's a big round so mm -hmm. uh, that was the first question and the second was about the interface you know <laughs> yeah it's a hyperbole and I mean now computers can uh, draw some beautiful interfaces so our role as designers will shift very strictly in the next uh, maybe years and maybe mm. even in a short time so I absolutely agree the that value what we are bringing will be shifting a lot in the next mm. upcoming months yeah so what we have what we have there next Mm, problem mm. validation. I mean, let's come back to our practical situation. So the client came to us, he asked us to do some, some designing work. And uh, we have, let's imagine we had some great conversation about the problem itself. So we don't have just the inquiry, but we have uh, the problem, we have the idea, we have the vision of uh, the stakeholders behind, behind the inquiry. Mm. So that's a good starting point. Uh, what should we do then as a designer? Should we validate that problem somehow or should we take it as it is? What do you right. think, Joe? Um, de definitely. So the, 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 the validation of the problem right, is, is an interesting thing because if you think... Um, if we think about it economically, uh, as designers, uh, if, if, if we go into prototyping and drawing interfaces, um, that's a very expensive kind of a process, right? Um, at that point, you're spending loads and loads of times, uh, hours, uh, investing into building out a solution, right? Um, so I'd say validating the problem is so definitely important. Epic. and um, it's perhaps something to be borrowed maybe from entrepreneurship, uh, particularly from sort of lean startup methodologies, which I'm sure uh, many of you have heard already about. Um, but they have this very sort of a powerful idea of, of rapid testing and, 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 and rapid validation of ideas early. I think it's a useful framework for us designers as well, kind of. Uh, and that's probably where user research methodologies uh, can be also very helpful. So um, mm -hmm. as soon, I think, as we have an idea of, well, okay, problem validation, right? So if, it, let's break it down. Um, yeah. Uh, we talked about this sort of arc of an idea or these steps of getting from, from a hunch of a potential, you know, opportunity area or, or, or a, 
or hunch for a potential product, right? What are the steps from getting from the hunch to the very end to that developed and implemented solution? So, so there is this sort of a vague feeling, I have a hunch about this might be an interesting thing. Then um, there's something about, first that needs to be explored, right? So collecting some more information, um, collecting some data about whether or not this opportunity area actually exists, right? Um, through that, information gathering you perhaps start understanding the we start understanding the problems that are in that area right so it's kind of like you know get get some data now we're starting to thinking think about the problem space now before we you've got the problem and we want to understand is this a real problem that someone really has right so mm -hmm. at that point what can we do i guess user research um do uh, a little bit of ethnographic uh, studies, um, observational uh, research, um, good quality interviews, um, inquiring about the past of users' uh, life, right, in that particular problem context. And I think at that point, we are able to say, eh, you know, like this maybe isn't exactly a huge pain for people. Um, mm -hmm. Or the other way around, it's like, yeah, yeah, people are really bothered by this thing or they are missing this thing in their life. So mm -hmm. that's probably what I would consider a validation of a problem, right? When I have good understanding of the problem opportunity space and I can clearly define the problem in one sentence and then I go to someone and they go, yeah, I get it. Like, that makes sense, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. And perhaps so I can finish up that little arc because um, it's kind of right, design thinking has that double diamond uh, diverge converge process, right? So uh, we're at the problem, then it's a question of diverging around potential solutions, right? Because that problem could be solved by, you know, in myriad ways. Uh, it's It could be an app, it could be, um, um, a can of some stuff, right? Like, and that thing could solve your hunger problem equally well if, you know, the app guides you to a grocery store and uh, the can just keeps coming to your door every Monday. Right? Yeah. <laughs> like, both solve the problem and, uh, and that doesn't have to be an app, right? So you, you've, mm -hmm. there's loads of potential solutions. Um, you're probably then looking at the ideation of the solutions and you're trying to validate that they do solve the problem or that they address the problem well for that user's context, particularly. Um, and after that, you know, like all of this stuff that we've done and we've built some confidence and some knowledge, only I think at this point, we have good solid ground and let's say a validated concept uh, mm after a validated problem that I think is worth investing into. Um, mm -hmm. And that's, you know, pouring all your resources, bringing your best engineers, your best UX, UI designers, and get creative and build something awesome and innovative and sexy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very beautiful set. <laughs> and, uh, but you mentioned that, uh, so just let me summarize, to, to uh, validate if we are trying to solve the right problem, we need to, um, we can use some uh, some uh, good techniques which we already know, like user research, observations, interviews, interviews with users, with stakeholders, and um, mm -hmm. try to look in the past, try to look at the data, try to look in the market if there is a place, if there is a situation uh, or our position to to go there with the solution and so on and so on. And this all, all of these things are pretty expensive. I mean, not pretty, but you still need mm -hmm. a good argument to talk to the client to make it, you know, you need to be mm -hmm. argumentally strong. So, so uh, what, how can we approach this as a designers? I mean, to our, to our clients and tell them what's the, Tell them, I mean, what's the value behind then if we are talking the, the, the value, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so this comes into my mind, into, into the topic of uh, business talking as a designers. The importance of talking business to our clients is a really important thing. And uh, there are several different ways how to approach this. Maybe you, Joe, you have a lot of experience from Framelabs. Can you give us some advices? how to talk business to our clients to 
make them or to have some arguments in our hands, which we can use to do some validation, some research and get us some data. Sure. Yeah. Let's talk business. Um, uh, so let me see. There are kind of two, two important, I would split that into two different areas. There is one of the areas is kind of really understanding the economics a little bit and the entrepreneurial side of things. Um, so yeah, the, the economical side of things that kind of business talk, quote unquote. And the other area I think is about human relations, right? Human dynamics and uh, being on the same page with the customer. Cause it's a, it's a sensitive thing that they are, they're investing a lot of time and money and heart and soul into whatever they're building. Um, so being, being able to speak business is helpful because we can justify our choices and recommendations with uh, sort of a sound economic reasoning, but being able to build a good relationship actually and build understanding from the client, um, it's almost a political matter. Uh, right, it's a relationship in building political matter uh, is also important because it is such a sensitive matter uh, to them. So it's two aspects. Um, I can dive a little deeper into each because I've got a few thoughts on each if you'd like. Um, yeah. Uh, so the, the, the economic aspect of it, what I found really helpful in my career and exploration of these things is just generally getting a little bit into entrepreneurship, um, trying to think about you know, what it takes to build a startup, what it takes to build a product. Uh, I was lucky to join a growth company in Helsinki, which was musician and um, sort of witness what it takes to make something out of nothing and then scale it to 300 million users. And it's absolutely nuts, that process. Um, and then thinking about the economy, the operational economy of the of the product is helpful. Right? I'm not saying that we need to be business people and economists as designers, but it's probably useful to be aware of, okay, so like if I choose uploading videos instead of pictures into a bank application for whatever frivolous aesthetic reason I, I envisioned, it's gonna cost this much more, this many more gigabytes of data, which is in turn gonna cost you know 20,000 more euros every month to the customer right um, so thinking a little bit about operational costs um, there's a lovely there's a lovely framework uh, I think it was Jesse Jim, James Garrett uh, Jesse G Garrett uh, five levers of business right and um, so thinking a little bit about the economics thinking about um, if the product delivers economic value as well as value to the users and the key values I'll try to remember is it increases revenue, it decreases uh, cost, um, it increases brand value. Um, there are two more, which I'm not sure if I will be able to remember now. Increases revenue, decreases cost, uh, increases brand value, um, increases, oh, drives new business, right? So can acquire new customers. Um, or increases retention. So it's, you know, so the kind of the key five business levers, uh, which are mm -hmm. interesting to think about. Um, mm -hmm. And our customers care about that. I mean, ultimately, we're helping build businesses and products that support businesses, right? What um, was what was the yeah. last one? What was the last one? Uh, what was the last Acquire, one? <laughs> uh, increase brand value. Uh, Increase revenue, decrease cost, acquire new customers, and the last one. Yeah. Retention. Uh, there was attention, uh, retention. That's right. Retention. Uh, thank you. Yeah. So repeat business. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, a, okay. it's a wonderful, wonderful talk. So that's, that's the economic great. perspective. Mm -hmm. Right. And then there is the relationship relationship perspective of okay, now I know a little bit how to speak to the customer and these considerations I think will help me design better things. Now it's a question of how do I make sure that we have a continued conversation with the client on these things, that it's not just us working in silos in our beautiful design office, making proposals and then coming to them and freaking them the hell out 
with you know increase of costs or or solutions that aren't mm -hmm. going to work or mm -hmm. that entire thing like we have these ideas and then the customer doesn't understand or reject them or you've had a lovely example there about when you realize that what the customer does actually doesn't make sense at all right um so economics relationship mm -hmm. oh that was really wonderful and <laughs> A practical as well. I was about to ask for the, you know, the tool that we can have uh, as designers in our hands that we can use to talk to our clients in more business way, in a way that they actually understand more because, you know, most of the time they are the stakeholders. Uh, they need to think about business. So these five things are really good because uh, we as designers can think about every feature or every, or about every step that we are doing in our process in the terms of one of these five pillars of financial mm -hmm. accessibility of the product. I mean, I mean, for example, if we would like to make a pro uh, problem validation, we can use this, okay, we need to validate the problem because uh, it can, if we will be developing and designing uh, wrong solution to the wrong problem, it will increase your costs and so on and so on. So, so if we will do this kind of investment at the beginning of the process, which in terms of design, it's very little compared to development mm. costs later. It's like a day, or right? Marketing It's a day, costs. day long conversation. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's uh, it makes all the sense because small user research is better than no research at all and everything what you do as a designer at the beginning is it can save a lot a lot of uh future costs so yeah this we can use as argument definitely definitely a good point okay what do we have there uh next Mm, so talking business as a designer it's definitely a good thing Def defining project success that's that mm. can be a next step right so let's come back to our practical situation we already did some problem validation we found out the right problem and uh, so we have some solution already picked for the problem and now we are mm -hmm. trying to think how we will know that we arrive you know in terms mm -hmm. of the project how we will know that that the project is successful how to set up because this is also a step of the kickoff phase. Mm. No, that's a really good point. And kind of connects back again to the expectation setting, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Where lots of the tension, I think when we were setting up this conversation, we were kind of coming from the point of disappointments and frustrations that designers or project teams might feel uh, during a project and client might feel also during a project, right? Um, so avoiding these pitfalls and these disappointments and these misaligned ex expectations is kind of a, I guess that's the key thing of the kickoff or, or creating that alignment. Um, so um, let me see. Um, so we talked about that relation that, that aspect of relationship, right, uh, in building up with that with the customer. There's two, two wonderful things happen when you kind of open up that conversation, right? Yeah, that's the thing. Um, I think uh, it's, it's, it's a lot about opening up the conversation with the customer and uh, being very transparent overall about the design process. I don't know why us designers are so kind of afraid to, to bring the customer in to the table, right? Uh, right? I mean, there's these horror stories of like, you know, make it pop or, hey, this is Johnny, my pug. Can you put like Johnny on my website? Like uh, that, those nightmare stories. Yeah, sh sure that might happen, but I kind of suspect that these things don't happen because they're, that the person is sitting next to you all the time and understands the process. I think they'd rather happen because the person doesn't understand the process and the goals, right? Um, in, the, in a sense, um, us makers, designers, engineers, project managers in a process like this, our responsibility 
our goal is to reach our customers' goals. And sometimes that can mean that we want, we need to help them explore and understand their goals because they don't necessarily have the tools to, to understand their goals, right? But we do, like that's what we're trained for. That's what our expertise is uh, to help explore and understand what a product should do and uh, what's the user problem that we, as we talked and so on. So it's quite a lovely idea, a lovely thought um, to, to help the customer during the goal setting process. So one thing that we would specialize in quite, quite a bit in Fram Labs is um, we wouldn't necessarily do, we're, we, we're not a design agency, we're a facilitation company. We facilitate innovation for corporate customers, right? So we effectively help others think and do as designers would, right? Um, so we bring in people, we, we drive them through the creative process and we try to help them understand the right things, discover the right things, adopt the right tools and the right mentality, and ultimately set the correct goals. Um, so bringing the customer uh, in very early and opening up the process, almost kind of saying, you know, hey, Jennifer Smith, you're working for this bank. Let's think about this together, right? Let, let's sit down and let's think about what is it that you're trying to do? Let me help understand. Let me help you understand, right? It's a very human kind of a relationship and conversation. So, um, and there are good sort of tools and crutches that can be also used, but that alignment, that initial alignment of we're partners at the table. Let's set these goals together. And by the way, if you've got a boss that's breathing on your neck and that boss has a boss that's breathing on their neck, what should we do with those people? Mm -hmm. Bring them along. Bring Just, them yeah. to the table. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Right. Yeah. So uh, making sure that we get as much alignment and as much input as early on and um, being able to then keep the people in the loop about the goals. Because you've touched on this, I think, Michal, um, setting goals, knowing what success looks like um, mm -hmm. in the end, that's a moving target. I mean, you guys would know it. You've done hundreds of projects that you request, right? Mm -hmm. And requirements change and goals change as you learn new things. And especially mm -hmm. in something like the creative process, which is highly unpredictable mm -hmm. and... Mm -hmm very dependent on, on what you learn along the journey. Mm -hmm. So yeah, the, the goal setting, it's not as much about goal setting to me, it's more about exploring together almost with the customer. Mm -hmm. hmm. And this is very beautifully said, the goals are moving subjects. I love that. I'm going to use that idea, <laughs> that thought. Because, you know, when you, when you think about this, goals are moving subjects. Uh, if the subject is far away from you, uh, how are your chance to hit the target, right? Mm -hmm. If you are closer to the target, you are, your chances that you will hit the target are increasing significantly, right? So this brings me to the, to the thought that uh, let's make that step smaller as we can, you know, because when we make it big mm -hmm. step, like this is my goal. And, and you know, when, when the project, project and the project and when the product is too big from our experience, when it's too big, I mean, it takes like one year to build it. It never goes well because that's the, the too much of a project to, you know, to, to, to make it successful. Mm, your bigger chances are if you make the smaller iteration with the project, with a small product, build some kind of just product with one or two features, build an MVP, set the goals, your chances that you will hit the, uh, your that moving subjects in a far away in front of you are, are much higher compared to the, the long-term big goals. I just want to mention that. <laughs> Thank you. That's a good observation. And uh, a thought that that triggered for me, I, my colleague Toby, he has a wonderful, uh, wonderful metaphor that he's built on this uh, based on the creative problem solving process, uh, CPS. Um, 
sort of recognizes that we also don't know what the goal is oftentimes until we get on the journey, right? So he kind of, uh, he recognizes four different types of, of, of problems and he calls them, uh, he calls them quests, he calls them fogs, uh, paint by numbers and movies, right? And uh, the thing with the quests is <clears throat> that you, you know what you want, you don't know how to get there, right? So this is the sort of a type of a holy grail situation where, you know, the king goes and he says, oh, ah, yeah, bring me the holy grail, you know, and then establishes a, a bunch of knights and sends them off and then the knights need to figure out how to get there, right? So that's great. And sometimes you would know exactly what's, I don't know, like if you're a bank and you a Revolut launches in your country, you know, you've got a problem and you know that, oh, we need to build Revolut in order to stay competitive. That's kind of a holy grail project. So you know the goal, you don't know exactly how you're going to get there in your context, in your economy, in your business and so on. The fog, I think, is another very useful thing to think of, um, which is you don't know the problem and you don't know the goal, right? Mm -hmm. So you don't know the goal and you don't know how to get there. Only thing you know is that you have some kind of a problem, right? So he uses this metaphor of mountaineers being stuck in a fog on a mountain, on the peak of the mountain. The only thing you know is that you're, you're screwed because you're on, on the peak of the mountain and it's foggy and you don't know what to do. And you, you said that lovely thing about small steps, right? So you can still solve that problem, but the only way to solve it is to take small steps. And we, with every step, be quite careful about if you're about to fall off and die, or if this is safe to go and you need to, you can continue, right? So that's mm -hmm. the fogs. And then there's paint by numbers, which is your kind of typical digital transformation stuff. Um, that's when you know where you want to go and you, you know how to get there because it's been done a million times. You know, digitization of paper databases is, 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 is an, a paint by numbers problem. Like everyone mm -hmm. knows how to do that if, if they're capable technologically. Um, and then there is movies, uh, which is um, you know the process, you know the how, you don't know the result, right? So you know how to make movies, but you don't know what the movie is going to be like. Mm -hmm. And what he would tend to say is that it's a sort of a spectrum of upon which the creatives operate. Lots of the innovation, radical things happen in the fog. Lots of the kind of design agency stuff happens in, in the quests territory. And then, you know, some of the more implementative stuff of like digital studios would happen in the, in the uh, paint by numbers territory. I don't think we do that many movies in our industry. <laughs> It would be fun, though. <laughs> it would be more creative, more self-expressive. Amazing observations, Joe. <laughs> really amazing. Oh, can't take credit for uh, that. Thank that's, you. That's all Toby Scott. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> you said it. You put it on the table, on this table. <laughs> you deserve that. Okay, so defining the project success. Oh, I, I mean, I'm pretty surprised because at the beginning, I thought that we are going to talk about defining the project success in the terms of uh, setting up some metrics, KPAs or OKRs and the other fancy schmancy stuff. But mm, instead of that, we rather talk about the, the, the value of the product and the goals and uh, what is, you know, the, mm, we, we rather focus on the, the value that product brings um, compared to the, the metrics and KPIs and stuff like that. So I'm pretty happy. That's great. Uh, You're probably right, though, that these things need to be measured ultimately, right? And we need to be able to be held accountable for something. Um, mm, but yes. you're also right, I think, in the sense that the measurement is the easier part of the problem. Yeah, sometimes. I mean, if you know where you want to go, you probably find a way how to measure that. But if you don't know where you are going, you know, this is very interesting because if you if you don't know where you are going and you think you know, you would be you 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 may you might find really hard to find a good way how to measure that. So that can be a good exercise for us as designers, if we can find the metrics uh, very easily, because we have a good 
uh, vision about where we want to go. And yeah. maybe this is also a good question to our clients, right? That's a virtual <laughs> hug right there. And that's yeah. exactly what I was thinking. Bringing client into that conversation is wonderful because right, it's again, opening up the process to transparency and it's about building trust and it's about repositioning ourselves from uh, people who hold mouse and do something for someone else to thought partners and uh, gives us sort of a critical input into the process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> brilliant. Okay, so what we have there next, I mean, we are close to the end of the event, but uh, I would like to tackle this topic and its tools. What tools we can use in this phase and in, uh, in the phase of uh, the, the kickoff with a client. I mean, you mentioned workshops, you mentioned uh, problem validation tools like user research methodologies, observations, interviews, etc. Are there any useful tools which you can recommend mm. to designers? Yes, um, sure. Uh, and just a note on time, I know we started a little bit late and I'd be delighted to uh, keep going after uh, the hour as well. If you guys have free uh, schedules and there's few of us, so we can surely have an open conversation. So I just want to open that option to you, Michal, should you want to uh, use it. Sure. Um, in terms of tools, all right. Um, tools is kind of a fun and misleading thing, right? Because when you, one of the first questions that designers get asked is like, what did you make this with? Is this Photoshop? Or like, do you use Sketch and what plugins do you use and all these things? So we can get really nerdy, nerd, nerdy yeah. about these things, right? Um, uh, I, I would suggest uh, to us here that we kind of reposition the com a conversation from software and from gadgets uh, rather into thinking tools. And because ultimately we're thinkers, right? We problem solving and requires critical thinking and, and, and collaboration is not an easy thing because there's lots of interpersonal questions and lots of anxieties that even the client might have, you know, ask a client who works at a bank, if they consider themselves creative, they're probably going to say no, right? But they are, and they have incredible creative power to share. So the lot of, lot of the tools that um, I'd like to share um, that I find useful in this process uh, are kind of designed to unlock people's creativity and unlock collaboration between, you know, developers, designers, business people, the project manager, the account manager, the, the, the client, the client's boss, the client's IT team and so on. So a lot of these tools I think are, are, are the creative problem solving tools, they're, they're, they should bring people together and they should enable us to tap into people's brains and get those brilliant thoughts um, that they have. So there are a few practical tools um, that I could mention. Uh, certainly there are the, certainly there are the very kind of typical tools like canvases and that sort of stuff that I think, you know, we can all find and know. Um, on the economic side, particularly one tool that's lovely is discovery driven planning. There's a wonderful uh, Harvard Business Review article about it and that helps kind of to understand a little bit of the operational costs. Um, then we've talked about the five levers. Um, there's lots written on the business and the business value. Uh, uh, what's the name of the business model canvas? Business model canvas, right? Oh, mm -hmm. These are quite useful things. Um, on the relationship side of things and on that creative collaboration and that unlocking of creative potential that's hiding in, in, in people. Um, lots of the facilitation tools are, are wonderful. And creative problem solving is a, is, is a powerful methodology. Um, sometimes it's, cause, so let's think about design thinking. Uh, co diverge, converge, right? So for those who are not familiar, uh, design thinking, one of its key principles is that um, it, instead of committing to that one idea for a solution that we have, it's, it's really useful to explore a vast area of opportunities and options um, and generate lots of opportunities and lots of options and then start selecting, right? So it's always like diverge around the, pro the problem, 
look at all the possible problems and then start filtering and find the problems that are interesting. So you converge again and then you diverge around potential solutions. You come up with crazy ideas for things um, and then you, know, you converge again, uh, filtering and selecting which of these ideas would be useful. So all this stuff can be done collaboratively, right? And bringing customers into the clients into that conversation is helpful because our perspective is limited. So our goal is to broaden the perspective. Our goal, mm -hmm. another goal is to create alignment, uh, give the customer sense that uh, they have input and they have, say, uh, they have a say in what's being done and that they're part of the process, right? That they're being heard. Um, broaden perspective I mentioned, the other thing was also reduce our own biases, right? Because we are, we have cultural and, and uh, educational biases and professional biases that we carry through with us. So reducing those, um, it's, it's another kind of nice side effect. So diverge, converge, it doesn't have to be complicated. One really lovely tool that you can use is just let's make a list, right? It's as simple as that. We don't need uh, hundreds of sticky notes and, and do that, but let's make a list. And then we get to the bottom of the list and it's like, let's take a break and let's try to come up with a few more things that we could put on this list, right? Um, and only after that, you, you can start um, killing things off the list. Another useful tool is from improv improvisation to theater is saying yes, um, right? Being open to new ideas and building on what's on the paper. I think a lot of people have this sort of propensity and it's very natural to be critical and to say, to reject ideas, right? So setting up the scene in a way saying, let's try to be open. Let's try to remember to say yes and, right? We, we say yes and, I, you, you give me something, I accept it, I hear you, we put it down on the paper and then I build on top of it, right? Improvised theater would never work if there was no yes and. Because <laughs> you one person says something ridiculous and the other has to accept it and build on top of it, like, you know? Um, so that's, that's kind of a use, useful mental tool as well. Um, let's mm -hmm. see what else is there. I love kind of asking for hopes and fears. It's a very equalizing and simple tool. Um, so it's almost the first thing I would do at, you could ask just about the meeting or about the project, you know, as a, as a whole, like, what are your hopes for this project or what are your hopes for mm -hmm. this meeting today? And conversely, what are your fears about this project? Right. And that sort of gives mm -hmm. you lots of, useful thoughts and useful input. Mm -hmm. It's good for building agenda for a meeting as well. Um, let's see if there is any other, there's loads of things in creative problem solving mm -hmm. process. Um, but those would be kind of the fundamentals, I'd say. And if we talk about value proposition, sorry, that's a complicated topic and there are lots of canvases. To me, value proposition is really as simple as, uh, Understanding who is the customer, defining what are, what's their problem, uh, thinking about the benefit that, you know, of like ha the flip side of having that problem solved, like what is it gonna, <laughs> bless you, Michal, and what is it gonna <laughs> change in their life positively? And then think about the solution. So customer um, problems or aches, benefits, and then um, the solution. And kind of decidedly having the solution as the last thing, right? And you can, of course, apply diverge, converge, and collaborative process to each of these boxes. Um, and then the classics, right? Like user personas, very important. Doing them right, not overcomplicating them, but doing them right. Basing them on real people is very important, right? So it's kind of having five conversations with people about their pains and creating one persona off of that, provided these people have enough similar things. Um, personas are super useful. Mm, that have been um, said a lot about user personas and a lot of biases are re related yeah. to, to this topic as well. So it's, it's really important to know how to do them because you might end up with just something that you have in your hands, but you know, but you don't know what to do with, with it. If you, if you will do mm. it just, you know, like imaginary personas from eight to 1000 years old persons and so on. Yeah, so it's really great to build them on the real data on 
um, after some research or stuff like that. That's very true. Yeah. I was, so I was just about just to couple, build a couple of things. Yeah. Mm, thank you. Really great tools. I mean, uh, I was just about to build uh, on you when you mentioned hopes and fears and start with a value proposition canvas because yeah, that's that's the tool that's, that is often connected with a kickoff meeting as well. Mm -hmm. So just let me I would, summarize. I would just, sorry, I, I would just say value proposition framework not necessarily the business model canvas i, I mm -hmm. find the business con model canva canvas is too convoluted too confusing it, it's mm -hmm. it's it doesn't give us as designers and makers of products i think all the necessary mm -hmm. it, it does too I mean, much and it's confusing yeah <laughs> and i think this is related to all the tools that we have mentioned that um, yes we are designers yes they there are some frameworks and some good methodologies and some principles but design process is not a linear thing you know so you don't need to go step by step following some framework some methodology if that step doesn't work for you or doesn't make sense for you to do it then don't do it because you don't have to right so if you think that doesn't make for you to follow some some rules on, yeah you know you know you know what i what i where i'm aiming no 100 percent, and, and thank you for mentioning that iterativeness the iterative nature of the design process because that's actually one kind of a mental tool that's really important to make the client understand right because mm -hmm they need to really buy into the idea that we're going on a journey together. We're going to be learning together about your customers and your business. And we're going to be finding out a lot of things. And as we go, we're going to adjust the way we approach this because we don't want to bloody fall off the cliff. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but that's really important. So being able to explain to them that this is an iterative process and lots of things are bound to change is yeah, that's a crucial thing. You're right. Yeah. Great. I mean, all of these are great points. I made some, yeah, we, we just, we just uh, arrived at the end of the agenda. So, but still, if you have any questions, just let the conversation going. I have one more question for you and it is, uh, what was painful or challenging, uh, experience for you as designer in the kickoff process are there any obstacles any topics that you would like to tackle or get an opinions on anything yeah that's a lovely question to ask uh the guys here romina petter uh, barbara muhammad i think it's a nice kickoff to the conversation so uh, let us know Uh, we can't hear you, oh, Romina. Feel free to unmute yourself and turn on your video as well. Uh, it would be nice to see your faces if you have the bandwidth. Yeah, I mean that would be great because uh, we can. We need to make a photo at the end of the event if we can. So if you can turn on the cameras, that would be amazing. Just for a second. Oh, nice, nice to see you guys. <laughs> uh, wait a second. <laughs> uh, okay, one more. Hey, Muhammad. Barbara, everyone is there. Okay, for okay. Now. If you don't mind, I will make a picture. Three, two, one, cheese. <laughs> okay, is there? Thank you, guys. So yeah, keep going. Let the conversation flow. If you have any question, yeah, let's debate. I'm pretty sure we all have experiences uh, with design kickoff and I'm sure we have a lot to share and I you know I'd be happy to share some of my perspectives from my 10 years of freelance experience and three years of leading a startup design team I made some uh, some notes as well so uh, we will be uh, duly provided by some uh, with, with some some output out of this conversation so uh, you can take take it and you know find it find more details about uh, the tools about the uh, methodologies and everything what uh, was being said so yeah i made my homework <laughs> no, it would be nice to hear about your experiences about your problems you faced 
You mentioned that you was working for startup. What's it called? You see? Musician. Musician. It's an application. Yeah. You don't guitar? Yes. Yeah, it's an yeah, application that I'm using every day. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> it's that's amazing. awesome. I'm your user. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, glad you like it. <laughs> awesome. And it's constantly improving because there were some updates, mm. some changes with interfaces. And yeah, mm. it's getting better. I love it. Well, it's good to hear that they're not uh, that they're not just getting lazy after I've left. <laughs> yeah, there's I think, some changes. That's very cool. <laughs> guys, this moment was that was the final destination of a designer. You know, <laughs> when you see your user be so surprised. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That moment. That's awesome. Um, yeah, but I don't know. It, I can give kind of a general overview of what that journey with Usician was, or if you have any particular questions, um, I'm happy to answer those too. Mm. Yes, I, I can. Yeah, sure. Just share it with so them. Mm -hmm. So, uh, getting to a startup was interesting because um, I. I've been a freelancer for most of my life. So it's, I think the agency life is a little different from, uh, from or freelancing or agency life is a bit different from actually tending to one thing for a long time. Uh, but I've also been really interested in entrepreneurship and I've been drinking the startup Kool-Aid pretty much ever since, I don't know, Tumblr, you know, uh, came out and realized people made these things. Um, so, from the design perspective, I thought it, it taught me a lot because uh, as an agency person, um, uh, I hope I'm not going to start a crazy exodus from good request now because everyone's going to be like, oh man, I want to grow and learn and build a product for three years. <laughs> no, I wouldn't necessarily recommend that, but it made me, it, it really helped me grow as a designer because in an agency, you are all surely familiar with this. You know, you get a client, you're with them for a quarter, you resolve some of their problem. You build something cool, you have a lot of fun. Mm. Maybe sometimes it's a year year long thing, and then it's gone. And you're mm. yeah. then you left with this sort of wanting of responsibility almost uh, an investment into their success right where you're like yeah but my job doesn't end here i'd like to understand you know did this really help them did this work as intended for their customers and so on um so that was really cool uh when i joined musician that suddenly that responsibility came into the picture and in turn it made me much better designer because i had to focus so much on uh, the consequences of what I was making, right? So it sort of stopped being just about delivery. It also started become, being about measuring what was delivered and then trying to figure out, ah, like, does it work that the menu is now here and it's not there? And do we need to rethink the whole thing? And then you have this never ending backlog of other things that you would want to be doing and need to prioritize all that. Um, so it was really interesting in that sense that for me as a designer and design became this sort of feedback loop for myself. And I really had to start paying attention to the data. Uh, we used Mixpanel to, to measure pretty much every single interaction in the app and reflecting on bi-weekly basis on which features should be built. Um, that was also the time where I really started embracing user research um, before I was mostly focused on UI and the craft. Uh, and at Usician, I started really respecting uh, Terhe, uh, my user researcher. She's, she's just been wonderful. And uh, getting into the lab and seeing users play the instruments and so on was just re so revealing. Because I didn't. You, you guys know that feeling when you hear of a user not being able to do something in your app, and the first thing you think is like, hey, "You stupid idiot!" <laughs> You know, how, how do you not get this? It's so, I made it so clear. Like the button is literally at the bottom of your screen. You can't miss it. And then every, like 80% of your users just don't click that button. You're like, all these things, it's sort of, yeah. That, that was really helpful in that sense uh, of 
killing my ego and sort of pulling my head out of my bottom uh, as a designer and recognizing that a lot of the things, a lot of the choices that we make aren't really as good as we think they are. Um, so that was great. And the last maybe really important thing for me at Usician was uh, started thinking about design more broadly uh, from the perspective that so I was brought in to Usician to establish the UX department effectively, right? Before the company was very engineering driven and uh, the product looked like it, right? It's, this is 2015, it's on Unity built by a bunch of music nerds and software developers. And you know, it, it literally had menus in two different places and sometimes people would have to quit the app because they got lost so that that's how they would get to the homepage. Um, so, uh, thinking about how to, how to change the design culture within the company, uh, help me think a lot about the value of design and measurement of design and sort of thinking about how do you equalize, um, the playing field or level the playing field so that your managers, your developers, um, uh, can be part of that conversation. Um, and practically speaking, what that meant in musician, um, I did a lot of design thinking workshopping, trying to help my colleagues uh, understand the value of design and the, the, the power of creative methodologies. Um, it also helped me understand what design is about, right? <laughs> I started to stop thinking just about aesthetics and pixels and more about what is it that these people can do take away from design methodology that will be helpful for their job. Like think about your project manager, for example, um, in what ways can they benefit and adopt some aspect of design approach? I don't want to use design thinking, right? Cause that's a methodology, but design approach that would make their, that would make them better as a project manager or as a product manager, either way. Right or your software developer, like what do they, what could they learn from design that would make them a better developer? Um, so that was kind of an interesting transformation, thinking about all these things. And so I did lots of workshops. Um, I, what we did is that we built basically our design system. That was 2015, design systems weren't really a thing that was being talked about at that point, but we had a design system in Sketch. We had a design system in Unity, which was mirrored. And then we made a design system in Keynote, right? So we kind of had a three touch points for the thing so that all designers could work with it. Project managers, product managers could imagine, envision new features in a piece of software that they knew how to work with. And it wouldn't take them ages to, you know, put a button here and there and they could just catch it up. And then developers wouldn't necessarily need to get uh, specifications, detailed specifications with pixels and stuff, because they would know that, oh, this button component in Keynote, that's totally in a wrong place because it shouldn't be here. Actually, in Unity already has its place. And, um, right, so, so sort of equalizing the, leveling the playing field and bringing people on board. So this was some of the key kind of challenges that I faced uh, at Usician and a lot of this made me think about the value of design and, uh, and how design can empower others to build better things and better products. And then how do you measure success of design and how do you bring maybe some of the growth marketing, quote unquote, tools um, to help us reflect on our work and do better stuff. Um, yeah, and then I left in 2017 because I figured, wow, design is so powerful and I'm making pixels uh, in an app that teaches people how to pay, play music, which is lovely, but then there is, you know, climate change and global warming and, uh, you know, uh, lots of societal issues that could probably benefit from design methodologies and uh, more people working on those. Yeah, beautiful I don't know story. what you guys think. I think that's a beautiful story and uh, even that I uh, already heard that story for several times. It, it still moves something inside of me. <laughs> yeah, but you mentioned beautiful thought again, that uh, how we can use design on what we can learn 
uh, what we can teach others, our colleagues, customers, developers, managers, everyone in the company or out of the company to empower their work uh, uh, with with design? I mean, that's a great question because, you know, yeah, it's a very powerful tool. And sometimes we forget about it, just diving, uh, digging into the pixels and yeah. I love to talk with you, Joe, <laughs> just because of this, because you take take us out of the out of the you know you take us on the surface and that's great <laughs> yeah man i love you too brother <laughs> <laughs> virtual hack always good time <laughs> okay guys uh do you have any questions for joe or for anybody else really yeah uh, as well Oh, good. Thank you, Joe, for sharing your, for your journey experience. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, <laughs> thank you Joe. And thank you, all of us, all of you guys to attend this event. And uh, I mean, I think that we have set up a very warm, uh, very, very warm call or very warm culture around us. <laughs> And uh, I love that. I absolutely love that. I mean, this is something which is directly connected with you, Joe. <laughs> you just, you just, uh, you just make it. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys, for coming, and or for opening, <laughs> opening the event. And uh, it's a pity that uh, more people can't be here, but we will try to share the most out of this event with others. So, Lovely. thank you very much. Well. Thanks for having me and it was really nice to have this conversation with you all. And uh, feel free to find me on the internet and connect on LinkedIn and whatever. My email is also accessible. So if you want to yeah. follow up, uh, welcome. Perfect. Thank you so for Thank you guys again. Thank you. Have a great day. Bye. Bye. Ciao. Take care. Bye.